Uh, and we're just going to start uh, in a couple of minutes to wait for a few more people. Yeah. Mike, we have about 19 to 20 people here in the room. I see. Oh, okay. And we have uh, another uh, eight to 10 people on Zoom right now. So uh, a pretty good turnout, considering just the first time we've done this uh, in 16 months. This far in, in person meeting. Uh, well, we do have um, four people who are new to us, and uh, happy to have uh, Brian Franklin, Robert Faith, David Johnson, and Neil, excuse me, Nate Walker are here with us. Um, and we hope that we can get them to join our, our, our Sabre chapter. Uh, for our local members, uh, we passed out a card. Uh, for Joe Russell, who was a longtime member of our Sabre chapter and whose husband was the general manager of the Houston Buffs back in the day. Joe was in a nursing home and uh, not doing real well, but we're going to send her a card, just to tell her we're thinking about her. I also spoke to uh, Larry Miggins today, who's another longtime member of our chapter. Larry is not very mobile anymore. In fact, he had a little bit in the hospital last week. Um, but he's doing pretty well, and uh, he's going to be featured on a five-minute telecast uh, probably next week. Jason Bristol, who's a local TV announcer, wants uh, Larry to talk about when he was with the Buffs, and they decided to use short pants. <laughs> and Larry refused to wear the short pants. So that ought to be a very interesting article that she's going to put on. Where she's going to put on? Keep her. Um, there's ketchup, mustard, mayo. Thanks. As you probably have gathered, we're rather informal here. Um, we've got uh, you know, lots of people, guys and gal, and we're anxious to hear from you, Mike. Uh, Mike has a extensive history in baseball. He was a, he started off his playing career as a uh, Second baseman to the San Diego Pirates farm system. And uh, like so many young people, he had an arm injury. And so he went into the front office. And I see you smiling about that, Mike. Um, he uh, then turned to be his general manager of some of the uh, minor league San Diego teams until uh, he joined the Padres uh, Major League Club. Um, we have various responsibilities. Um, then he went to the California Angels, where he was uh, chief uh, vice president of administration and a general manager uh, from 1980 to 19, 1984 to 1990. He was the president of the Arizona Fall League. And then he joined the uh, um, Boston Red Sox as a uh, vice president of baseball operations. And if that wasn't enough, he went with Major League Baseball as vice president of umpires. I wow. know that has to be an interesting position for him. Uh, Mike, we have, uh, we'll see how it works. We'll have people both here at the restaurant and people on Zoom who want to ask me questions. And so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it works out. Uh, I'll thank Chris and Joe for putting together the meeting as far as the te technical aspects of it. So Joe, uh, Mike, I'll turn it over to you. and. Uh, uh, see if you have any introductory comments that you'd like to make or what have you. But welcome just to our Sabre chat. Thank you. It's my my privilege to be with all of you. And uh, uh, when Joe sent out his uh, reminder email earlier today, uh, I took a list uh, just to see how many members were in your chapter. And as I mentioned to Joe in a return email, the number of people overall in your chapter uh, just about outnumber uh, some of the crowds that we drew in those early days at San Diego. Uh, but uh, uh, that said, uh, a privilege to be with you. I would uh, say admittedly at the outset that uh, I am really a bit of a, uh, uh, an arch conservative baseball dinosaur. And uh, it's not that I'm uh, opposed to the pain, but we realize that many things change over here. the years, but uh, I think I would be more interested in seeing order, orderly change and reason change in a lot of respects. Uh, that said, uh, I, I welcome your questions and uh, I may not be quite as uh, 
definite a fan of the game of the modern game as I uh, used to be, but uh, I still uh, am somewhat uh, a frequent observer of the things that go on within the game. So uh, with that, uh, I welcome your questions uh, or, or comments for that matter. Mike, uh, Bill Brown, great to have you with us tonight. And I just have a question uh, since you are, you know, sort of, sort of like I am, you're more at arm's length now than you used to be and watching the game more as a fan. Uh, if you were commissioner of baseball, what changes would you make? Bill, I, I think the first thing I would do, uh, which I think would help in a number of respects, probably would not meet with overwhelming approval of the ownerships, but I'd, I'd reduce the schedule to 154 games and, uh, and give the players more days off. Uh, I think that one of the problems that the game has, as I see it in this day and age, is that some games are even lacking the connotation of action. Uh, statistically, you read about a, a ball being put into play once every three minutes and for those of us uh, who knew baseball in years past, that makes it a little bit of a difficult game to watch. Uh, we know that in the overall now, uh, as many people have observed and written, uh, it's either almost a home run or strikeout. But I think with a lesser number of games, rolling it back to 154 or whatever in that range now, given the number of teams would be appropriate, uh, gives the players more days off, they're better rested, and within the game, uh, in the vernacular, they're, they'll have less excuse not to hustle. They'll be well rested. Uh, you'll have probably and hopefully more people inclined to run 90 feet hard four times a night, as Dallas Green once put it. Uh, but I think that's where I would start. Uh, that would be my primary uh, thing to do. Secondly, uh, I think I would try to educate the players Bill, and what uh, uh, the former relief pitcher Mike Marshall once referred to as muscle memory. And by that, uh, he meant that if you, if you pitch or play the game with some, I guess I would say with some dispatch, not making a mockery of it, but uh, if pitchers work with greater dispatch, as he put it, uh, you're more likely to be around the strike zone rather than taking a lot of time between pitches uh, and as you know, that puts your infielders back on your heels. It slows the entire pace of the game. And we found that out in the original season of the Arizona Fall League back in 1992. Uh, granted, we had leverage because we told the players that many scouts were going to be out looking for people in the expansion draft. And they're going to be looking for people who hustle and play with enthusiasm. Uh, and the players found out that by playing the game as it used to be played, as I say, with some, uh, with some dispatch, it was, a, it was a much better game for them. The hitters were better, the pitchers were better, and they had overall uh, quite a good time. Admittedly, that year in the fall league, we did not have television commercials, but between innings, the players still had to change sides and warm up, so that took some time. But interestingly, the average game time for that 1992 Arizona Fall League inaugural season was two hours and 23 minutes, average game time. And there was action, the players enjoyed it. Uh, so I think if enough education could be put forward to the players that they will perform better and it will be a better game, not only for them, but more importantly for the fans, I think that would be step number two. Number three, uh, and pardon my, uh, my arch conservative perspective, but I would wanna see the game return to what goes on on the field and that would be eliminating a lot of the current technology that I think infringes upon the game once the game starts. Mike, how much, uh, you haven't mentioned the new rules. How much does that, uh, how do you view that with such as the runner on second base in extra innings and uh, seven inning double headers? Well, I saw, uh, Francis, I saw, I think it was last week, where the current commissioner said that uh, that may be rolled back for 2022. Uh, his comment, uh, which I must admit I don't understand, 
he said that the man on second base and the uh, reduction of doubleheader games to seven innings were at, was at the recommendation of Major League Baseball's medical experts because of COVID. Now, if someone can explain to me that correlation, uh, you're, you're light years ahead of me in terms of intelligence, uh, unless, unless you find somebody on your club uh, who unfortunately has been infected with COVID and put them on second base to get them out of the dugout. I have no idea uh, how that correlation is, but uh, I think that the man on second base, I heard some Hall of Fame managers for that matter say, you know, this is, this is good because it helps your pitching staff, brings the game to a conclusion earlier. But uh, baseball, I think, is a game of a lot of tradition. And I think any changes, uh, rule-wise or otherwise, have to be made, uh, as I say, within, within the vein of reasoned change, not, not in a knee-jerk reaction fashion, uh, such as I feel has been very much the case within the last couple of years. All right, Tal, you got a question? Go ahead, Tal. Hey, Mike. Mike, this is Pal. Tal, how are you? I'm fine. Excellent. In, in, in your long and distinguished career, well, you, you, you've been associated with a lot of people from uh, Gene Autry to Doug Raider, uh, Jimmy Williams, some of the Astro, uh, I think San Preston Gomez, that Said the last three are all people that uh, San Houston fans can identify with. Russ Gomez is a manager. Jimmy Williams is a manager. Bill Brader is a great third baseman and so on. Uh, one, one, a lot of characters on Buzzy Clavese. I'm sure you've got some stories. But Sam, what I want to ask you about, and what you, you've experienced is that different ends of the spectrum. Uh, the 1986 uh, ALCS, when you were with the Angels, and you had a three to one lead over the Red Sox. And then uh, that didn't work out well. Conversely, 2004, you're with the Red Sox. You're down three games for the Yankees. And one that, and that obviously worked out well. What were your emotions? You got stories you want to want to relate to us about 86 and 04? Well, uh, Tal, with the, first of all, for those of you uh, who are in attendance here, uh, I, I hope I'm not overly dating us, Tal, but I first met Tal Smith in Key West, Florida in 1969, uh, when Tal came to town as the personnel director of the Astros uh, to view the mighty Coco Astros managed by Leo Posada uh, against the Key West Padres. So uh, Tal and I go way back, and uh, Tal, I, I would use this opportunity to say thank you for all the help you provided me over the years because uh, Tal has been uh, one of my guiding lights. But the 86 uh, World Series, uh, we, we did have the lead. Uh, that was the, uh, the Dave Henderson home run that more or less broke our back. Uh, however, uh, as unfortunate as that was, we had innings left in that game uh, and, and chances to win that game, even, even with uh, one situation, Rob Wilfong, uh, being on third base, and I, I think it was with less than two outs for that matter, and unable to drive him in. Beyond that, uh, we had two games left in Boston, and we couldn't close out either one of those. So uh, in hindsight, agonizing though it was at the time, uh, in hindsight, uh, it was just not meant to be. But we were privileged, uh, as Tal knows, to work for a very special owner in Gene Autry, and after that last game in Boston, when we had lost uh, that, that final game, uh, most of us were understandably a bit uh, morose, but Mr. Autry was not pleased, was not happy, but came to a group of us and I'll never forget. He said, what's the matter with all of you? Aren't we gonna play next year? So uh, to have an owner like that, uh, we, were, we were indeed privileged. The Red Sox in 2004, uh, that was just excitement from the beginning through the end. And I think uh, many of you know that current Dodger manager Dave Roberts uh, stole second base and really started uh, the, uh, the effort that helped us uh, prevail over the Yankees in that, uh, uh, that playoff series. Then the Cardinals in the World Series, 
Uh, the Red Sox were just not to be stopped, uh, breaking, uh, what, an 86-year-old uh, drought in terms of the World Series or winning its World Championship. Uh, and certainly they prospered even more from there now within the last, uh, what, 17 years winning four World Championships. From the standpoint of your experience, Mike, with managers, you go all the way from Zimmer to uh, Mark, you know, Raider or one night if you, if, 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 if you had to manage if you had to manage the seven game series now with the tips on the line who, who of, of the manager you were that you were associated with who would be your choice uh in fairness Tal, i could only really narrow it down to two and that would be well i'd have to say three between zimmer preston gomez and and gene mock uh, granted, Gene was uh, our manager when we lost in 86, and I know the rap, if you will, is that Gene had never won uh, the World Series, but to me, uh, any club that Gene managed was always better than it probably otherwise had a right to be. He had a knack of getting the most out of his players. Preston Gomez, uh, extremely uh, bright individual and just never really had quite the, the horses on his gloves to get the job done. Don Zimmer, consummate baseball man. In fact, uh, I must tell you that, uh, uh, as Tal knows, uh, Zim was my first manager uh, when I was the general manager of that Key West Club back in 1969. And you probably know that Zim never drew a paycheck outside of baseball. To say baseball was his life was an understatement. Uh, one night after a game, but he was a baseball man. He was not a geographer, and I found that out uh, because one night in Key West at Logan's Lobster House, uh, we were having a sandwich after the game, and over the bar, they had a map of the United States stretching the length of the bar, and down in the very lower right-hand corner, they had a red star, which was the location, as you know, of, of Key West, Florida. And Zimmer was looking at the map and he commented to me with respect to our boss in San Diego, Buzzy Bavese, the former Dodger general manager. Uh, Zim said, uh, that darn Buzzy. And I said, well, what's the matter, Zim? He said, do you realize we can't get any farther from San Diego than where we are right now? And I said, yeah. I said, where, where'd you think we were? And Zim, not the geographer, said, well, I thought we were like 70 miles east of Houston. So you know, he was better off on the baseball side. And uh, I was uh, indeed blessed in starting out my career with him and learning a tremendous amount about the game. But I think, Tal, now that I'm now that I've pondered it a bit, uh, if it was one crucial game uh, to win the world championship, I think I would go with Gene Mock because he knew every rule, every angle, and he too could put players in a position to get the best out of them. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, sure. Have any stories about umpires going on relate? Uh, many, many of them. Uh, I, you know, I found them to be a a special breed, and I, I owe them a debt of gratitude. Uh, my position with them, I must tell you, was really a uh, a management uh, endeavor. Uh, but I had a, a long-standing affinity for umpires because back during that first year at Key West, uh, when the league president, uh, who Tal would remember, the late George McDonald, charged me with protecting the umpires. And, and please understand, playing in Key West in those days was like playing in Havana. Uh, that, was, uh, that was the time where all of the original, as I call them, the original Cuban refugees uh, had fled Cuba mostly professional people, doctors, lawyers, professional people. This was even before the Marielle situation and so forth. And as Tal might recall, we packed that ballpark every night just because of baseball, never had any promotions. But uh, the fans, a lot of gambling went on. And uh, there was one night where in protecting the umpires, as I was charged by the league president, uh, we got garbage dumped on us. Uh, every foul thing you could imagine from fish heads to various liquids, whatever. Uh, and so I, I got a taste of what it was like to be uh, an umpire. Uh, 
Tal would well know. One of those umpires was a friend of Tal's by the name of Tom Romanesco, uh, who I still keep in touch with. Uh, the other umpire was the late American League umpire, Nick Bremigan. But after the game, uh, the umpires had parked out behind the right field fence and waiting for them to leave to go on to their next town uh, was a pickup truck with uh, four or five individuals in the back, one of whom was carrying a shotgun. And the county sheriff told uh, Tom and Nick, I can give you 20 minutes to get to the first bridge out of Key West. Uh, and I'll block that off, but then I've got to open it up because of the traffic. And Brennigan responded, 20 minutes, Sheriff. He said, that's not a whole lot. And the sheriff said, well, that's now 19 minutes. And I've never seen Brennigan and Romanesco drive off as quickly as they did in that situation. Uh, but the major league umpires, uh, I, I learned a lot and I learned it quickly. Uh, but I must tell you that uh, whatever people may think of him. One of my favorites uh, is, uh, is Joe West. Uh, and you know, I know the controversies uh, about him with regard to his umpiring and so forth. But uh, for example, uh, I spoke to him uh, oh, a couple of months ago, uh, we happened to have a conversation and uh, before the beginning of the season, in fact. And Joe told me that he had had a knee replacement, but before he could have that knee replacement, the doctor made him lose 30 pounds. So Tal will appreciate this. He went to the Duke weight loss clinic and shed a lot of weight. And when he went to check out the doctor, he did not know how much weight he had lost, but the doctor told him, Joe, congratulations, you lost 30 pounds. And typical of Joe West, he said, well, I guess that's okay, doctor. He said, but 30 pounds for me, he said, don't you think that's kind of like throwing a suitcase off the Queen Mary? And that, that's what you get from, from Joe West. But, uh, uh, but he taught me a lot. Uh, he taught me that, you know, as we know, umpires miss calls, uh, just like players strike out, miss ground balls, drop fly balls, throw wild pitches. It's, it's part of the game. But Joe was instrumental in teaching me that don't tell me that I missed a call, rather tell me why I missed it so that I can correct. And if that ever occurs again, get it right the next time. Uh, but uh, these are a special group of people and I, I know they draw controversy, uh, but uh, seeing what happens to some of them in terms of head blows behind the plate, if not injuries otherwise, and they stay in the game uh, is, is highly impressive to me. Uh, my, other, my other favorite, Joe West story uh, occurred my second day I was on the job in New York and Joe's number two man on his crew for many, many years, and probably many of you know the name was, was umpire Ed Rapuano. And Joe, uh, Ed came into my office to introduce himself. And he said, while I'm here, let me ask you a question. He said, why is it that every ballpark we go to before the game, they put our name and picture on the scoreboard. Uh, so I wish they wouldn't do that, but why do they have to do that? And the only thing I could think of to say was, Ed, do you want people to think you're Joe West? And he said, ah, got it, now I understand. So, uh, you know, they are, they are people of good humor. Uh, one thing that uh, goes unnoticed in these people's regard is that they have a, an organization called Ump's Care that has helped a lot of, uh, a lot of youngsters, uh, both uh, hospitalized and otherwise uh, get through college. They award scholarships, uh, but they do, they do miss calls. They do make mistakes. But I can tell you that uh, because I know there is a uh, discussion about the possibility of an electronic strike zone, uh, my latest information on the accuracy of the major league staff in terms of balls and strikes over the course of an entire season, that being 2,230 games, I believe, as a staff, I think it was two years ago, the major league staff averaged accuracy north of 98%. So pitches are missed, sometimes they're, they're badly missed, but in the overall, uh, these guys are pretty good. And the interesting thing to me was, Major League Baseball would tell them 
this is the best system money can buy. We're going to evaluate on the finest system available. And then when the umpires would turn in the numbers, as I indicated they do, Major League Baseball's reaction would be, wait a minute, these guys can't be that good. To which the umpires could only say, well, wait a minute, you gave us the system. So uh, it's supposed to be highly calibrated. They go through a lot when they use that system. But I would tell you that, unfortunately, what we uh, sometimes see on TV is a, a bit deceiving because bear in mind, you're looking at the pitch from the opposite direction that the umpire sees it. Usually the camera is a little bit at an off angle so that it's not in the direct sight line of the hitter. Uh, and there's really no appreciation for uh, depth perception. So uh, sometimes uh, in, a, in a technical sense, those things can be deceiving. But uh, as far as uh, the, uh, the calls that they make over the course of a season and, uh, and their, their pitch calling, uh, as I know it, they are incredibly accurate. And in terms of their training, uh, people uh, oftentimes say, well, you know, uh, why don't they get better umpires? And uh, part of that goes to the matter of minor league umpire salaries, because when I was there, I would tell you we had, I think of, of one fellow, his name was Ron, uh, who was an outstanding umpiring prospect, but he could not pursue the profession because he made more money parking cars as a valet at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. So they do put in the work. Uh, they, you know, they are uh, well-screened people uh, in terms of their character and, and so forth. Uh, not an easy job. And I, I figured out uh, after a while that anybody uh, can umpire or for that matter, officiate uh, at the highest professional level until they try it. And then you find out that uh, it certainly is not as easy as it looks. You might get the first call right, uh, maybe even as a guess, but more than likely without the training, without the knowledge, uh, it's gonna be somewhat downhill from there. Anybody, do you accept the way the strike zone is represented electronically on television? No, sir. Oh, sure. No, because uh, as mentioned, Bill, uh, you know, it, uh, you're looking at it uh, for the viewer, you're looking at it from the opposite direction that the umpire sees it. Uh, and uh, the umpires have told me that one has to bear in mind that where they're calling the pitch, by definition of the rule, it's as it crosses through or touches the strike zone within, within the boundaries of the strike zone. And when you consider today, Bill, that as we know, most hitters try to get as far back in the box as they can and then you've got the hitter behind that, and then you've got the umpire behind, excuse me, the catcher behind that, and then you've got the umpire behind that, uh, they've explained to me that we are really making the attempt to call that pitch out in front of us as it crosses the plate, not where it's received, given the movement on some major league pitches. And that's where I think oftentimes the uh, the viewer is, is deceived. Uh, there have been of the major league evaluated system as I know it, there have been about four iterations, uh, beginning with Quest Tech, and then I believe they went to Z System, and then I think they went to something else, and I think now it's TrackMan. Uh, they're they're always trying to improve it, and it goes undergoes uh, a lot of scrutiny to make sure that the system is accurate. Uh, but uh, for the viewer, it can be a tough thing when you're looking at it from the opposite direction without appreciation for the, uh, the depth perception and where the umpire might be calling the pitch. I do remember, Bill, as an aside, in the early days, they used to have a system where, uh, might have been under Quest Tech, where a technician would sit upstairs and, as, and watch on computer and spot the ball where it, where it passed over the plate. And I remember one occasion, uh, and I think the pitcher's name was uh, Valdez, uh, pitched for uh, Cleveland, a left-hander, uh, made a pitch, and the ball went in, and the spotter, I guess, realized he had spotted it wrong, and so on television, you saw the, the pitch go straight up. I thought that was a rather novel 
novel pitch, but uh, they, they've refined the system immeasurably since then. Questions in here? Yeah, if you can. Uh, Tony, you're talking about it. Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, number one, do you think ticket prices are too high these days? Uh, how much did a box seat cost when you started in Major League Baseball? What's the cost today? And secondly, I read that the commissioner's office in New York had a creation 700 or 800 employees in that building. It's about the size of a small federal agency. And uh, with a lot more power. So, uh, any observations on those two uh, questions? Well, uh, I'm sorry, I missed the first part of your question, so we'll we'll come back to that. But uh, the commissioner's office, uh, I have been told, numbers employees in the neighborhood of, if not north, of 1,000 people uh, in their new building in New York. However, uh, in fairness, that includes their advanced media segment which is MLB.com and probably a productions people. And, uh, and they have, uh, as you probably know, a lot of departments from marketing to design. I mentioned design because certainly we saw what happened with the all-star game uniforms. Uh, but uh, my, my understanding is in their new building on uh, Avenue of the Americas in New York, they tried to pull everybody together, put them all in the same building and uh, my understanding is that there are in the neighborhood of not more than 1,000 people uh, in that building. So uh, at least they are now condensed, at least they are now all in one spot, uh, but it is a very, very large uh, undertaking to say the least. And I would tell you that realizing it is the baseball commissioner's office, probably just a sign of the times in which we live, uh, the baseball segment per se is minuscule compared to the other departments. Uh, and I'm sorry, I missed, I missed the first part of your question. Well, I'll, let me ask you this. What do you think about the name Cleveland Guardians? Uh, I, I'm not, again, I'm for reasoned change. And, uh, you know, I grew up uh, in California uh, next to a, uh, an Indian reservation where a lot of the guys, <laughs> I don't know if times have changed, perhaps so. But I remember that a lot of the fellows from the reservation that I went to high school with, uh, they were big fans of the Cleveland Indians and they loved the Washington Redskins and they thought this was uh, a prominent thing for uh, Native Americans. Uh, probably different opinions now, granted, but Guardians, uh, I didn't know at first what they were. Someone had to explain to me that those are the two statues on the bridge uh, outside uh, of, uh, uh, of the ballpark. And so, you know, I guess uh, uh, time will tell whether or not uh, it's going to be well received. I haven't seen a terribly positive reaction to it so far. The other question he had was had to do with the uh, ticket prices, how they've gone up. And I, I have something you might be interested in. This is the 1980 Angels Media Guide, and you were the director of uh, uh, player uh, personnel. And the ticket prices are listed here. And the Angels' top price in 1980, $5. Can you believe that? 40, it's been 40 years, admittedly, but $5 was all it cost. That was the top uh, price down on the field boxes for the Angels when you were kind of breaking up, breaking in with the Angels in 1980. Well, Greg, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, which, you know, again, you'll have to, you'll have to pardon my arch conservatism, but, uh, you know, over the last two years when Major League Baseball uh, went to seven innings for double headers, I was trying to find out, uh, you know, since fans were going to be sh seeing four fewer innings of baseball in a double header, did anybody reduce ticket prices? And so far, I haven't been able to find anybody who did. Uh, historically, I think many of us uh, took a page from Walter O'Malley of the Dodgers. And we all well recall that in the 1970s and 80s, when the Dodgers were uh, among the foremost operated clubs in the major leagues and always, always drew very well. But uh, Mr. O'Malley had a philosophy that I think many 
many uh, emulated, Gene Autry being one, that it's, it's not good nor rational for that matter to dun the individual fans who come to see you play. He would rather make the revenue through the number of fans who came. And so the Dodgers uh, and Cal might recall for many, many years, the Dodgers had no, no price increases whatsoever uh, for I think probably 20 plus years, they never increased prices. Whereas now it seems that every year uh, people will review their, their ticket prices and find some way to uh, uh, you know, fathom an increase. Uh, I realize we live in different times, but uh, realizing what your product is supposed to be, and that would be, to me, winning baseball games, uh, I was uh, uh, quite taken aback uh, two years ago when the Red Sox had a, a very poor year and yet saw fit to uh, increase ticket prices. Uh, the fans did not react well to that, and I think that's, you know, that's understandable. But uh, now, uh, you know, $75, Greg, it might be for, in some places for, for a box seat, uh, might, not be, might not be unreasonable, might not be strange. So uh, granted, uh, uh, years change things, the money has changed, uh, but uh, I think that uh, uh, some people would do well to gravitate to that O'Malley philosophy and figure Let's get more people in the ballpark and make more people fans of the game rather than just having people try to bring a family of four to one game and have it cost maybe in the neighborhood of three to four hundred dollars. By the time you consider parking, tickets, concessions, a family of four, that, that could be about what it would run at a Red Sox game today. So we have a question from Alan and then a question from uh, Rod. So go ahead, Alan. Hey, thank you. Uh, my question's about um, geographic alignment of the divisions and the leagues to try to minimize travel and so forth. And like obviously putting Houston into the American League with Texas, you know, that's something that, you know, help, gives each team a shorter trip. But I was thinking, what about going even further and swapping Seattle and Arizona. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever considered this. If, Mike, if you know if anyone's ever considered this, you could build more of a Southwestern rivalry with Arizona and Houston, Texas, and you'd get rid of that, you know, Houston or Dallas to Seattle, which really seems like a very long trip. Um, I guess more generally though, how often do GMs and MLB officials um, discuss those things um you know it doesn't it doesn't happen very often but that would that would seem to be one that could readily be done uh i, I think it would be uh possible and achievable i think the the uh the uh, controversy would probably arise between the uh, i guess you would say the, the the modern uh idea of doing that and the traditionalists who value some of the other rivalries in the league and the league structures. Uh, but uh, I think it's it's important to remember distance though there is, uh, and, and maybe this goes back to my earlier thought about uh, you know, reducing, reducing the schedule, uh, but uh, bear in mind that I don't know of any major league club now who does not travel by chartered aircraft. And so, uh, and some of those uh, I imagine like basketball or if not football also are could be uh, customized aircraft. So it's not, uh, the travel is not in some respects as, as grueling as it once was. Uh, but I, I think possible and, and reasonable, yes, that might be the case, but then how many people are going to adopt a more traditional stance and say, we like things the way they are. Uh, I think you're right, it, it doesn't happen very often, uh, but uh, to my knowledge, the last, uh, arrangement came about because of uh, interleague play and wanting to, you know, create a, a different schedule and so forth. So uh, I have not heard anything about that uh, myself, but you can never, as many ideas as the current commissioner's office seems to come up with, I don't think you can rule anything out. All right. Um, Rod, Rod asked me to add. 
ask you the question, Mike. May he ask if you would expound upon your days running the Arizona Fall League and where you place uh, where he places his contribution to the start of the AFL among your career achievements. Well, the the Arizona Fall League, uh, uh, I have been uh, that seems to be the lot of many people in baseball. I was. Uh, 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 let go by the Angels in uh, in May of 1991, and it was uh, February of 1992 that I received a call from the Deputy Commissioner Steve Greenberg, uh, as many of you probably know, former former Ranger farmhand uh, who was the son of uh, uh, the great uh, Hank Greenberg, and Steve asked me to uh, start this league, which was really the idea of Roland Heeman. Uh, Roland, a longtime baseball executive and, and very dear friend of so many of us. It was Roland's idea, but Steve said they needed someone to put it into practice. And it was really quite an adventure because as I say, I got the word in February, uh, the league was to open in September and we had nothing other than perhaps a clean sheet of paper so within that several month period from uh, February to the opening in September, uh, we had to figure out how we were gonna get players, how they were gonna get paid, uh, get facilities in the Phoenix area, uh, design uniforms, get the uniforms, order based, everything had to be accomplished, uh, but uh, somehow uh, we made it. Uh, one of my uh, key right-hand people who assisted greatly in that effort uh, was, a, was a gentleman that uh, uh, Tal and, and many of you know, uh, Tim Perpura, uh, who uh, went on to become the Astros general manager in their World Series appearance in, the, in 2005. Uh, but uh, it was a headlong race. Uh, we did make it. And I look back on that fondly. As I say, the, the players uh, enjoyed the experience. Everything went smoothly. And I often reflect back on that experience uh, because, uh, you know, we, we did everything within the space of a very few months. Uh, I don't think it can be done now, but I owe a debt of gratitude uh, to Steve Greenberg, then the deputy commissioner, and, uh, and Bill Murray, who was then the uh, administrative officer for Major League Baseball, uh, because... Uh, Suffice it to say, in doing what we had to do, we flew low and fast. Uh, we, uh, we did things just to get them done uh, from knowing how bureaucracies can sometimes be. Uh, we operated from February through the middle of July on, on my American Express card uh, because Major League Baseball was just a little bit slow in being able to establish a checking account for us. So I'm forever indebted financially and otherwise uh, to Bill Murray for speeding my expense accounts through. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we had uh, a marketing assistant to me by the name of Lou Klimchak, a former major league infielder for the Cleveland Indians or Guardians, Indians in his day. Uh, and uh, Lou, very knowledgeable marketing guy, we went on the radio one night and held a name the team contest uh, with the prize for the six teams being selected the names of uh, fall league season tickets. Uh, interestingly, one of those team names was the Diamondbacks. It was the first couple of years of the Arizona Fall League. It was the Chandler Diamondbacks until Phoenix was awarded their major league franchise about seven or eight years later and saw fit to uh, acquire the name. Uh, but we had no challenges to the name. Uh, the uniforms were individualized to each club uh, and everything went, uh, went rather smoothly. And uh, uh, we, for the first several years, uh, it's my memory that the succeeding year's league rookie of the year would have, was a participant in the Arizona Fall League, Mike Piazza, uh, Tim Salmon, uh, ultimately Derek Jeter, many of the guys along the way. Uh, and the idea of the league, thanks to Roland, was that if you watched an Arizona Fall League game, you were hopefully going to see the following year's Rookie of the Year. And for the first number of years, that turned out to be the case. 
Uh, the league has been suspended because of COVID for, I think, well, at least the last year, but I understand they may be going back into gear uh, this coming fall. Oh, I, I see Frank. Yeah, yeah Mike. Someone asked you earlier about uh, things you would do if you were commissioner. What's your position on interleague play? Would you eliminate that if you were commissioner? Uh, no, I think it has a certain attraction now because it's been with us a while. Frank, at, at first, uh, I you know I, I wasn't again arch conservative. And the dinosaur, but I wasn't a fan of it. But I think now it's become an accepted part of things. Uh, one of the things that I always found enchanting about, uh, and it probably circles a bit also uh, about around the discussion about the designated hitter. Uh, whenever, whenever Red Sox pitchers were getting ready to play an interleague game uh, where they had to hit, it was always interesting around the batting cage to hear the guys say, "Well, I hit 597 in high school." You know, and I, well, I hit 472 and, you know, uh, and then they would get in the game and were totally defenseless. Uh, I know there, uh, uh, I know there are still uh, controversies about, well, the pitcher's hitting in, in one sense and then not in the other. Uh, but I think now in so many respects, it's become pretty much an accepted part of the game. Uh, perhaps uh, as a thought, and I haven't really studied it, but if one were inclined to reduce the number of games in the schedule, maybe some of those interleague games would be the one to go. And you, and you win and play uh, in your own league or the way it used to be. As a follow-up, again, as commissioner, would you make the DH universal? Uh, I would not. Uh, and Frank, I'll explain why. Uh, Dave Garcia, a longtime coach and former major league manager, uh, and and I, I personally believe in this. Uh, Dave told me when he was managing the Angels uh, back around 1978, uh, he said, you know, the great thing about baseball is that everybody has to play the game. Everybody has to throw the ball. Everybody has to catch the ball. Everybody has to try to hit the ball. And at the time, he said, you know, it's not like football where the game can be won by a guy who never blocks, never tackles, never throws a pass, never catches a pass, never runs the ball. Uh, if he's a place kicker. And, and I've always found that to be uh, an attractive part of baseball that everybody uh, has to uh, has to play the game. And I think, you know, pitchers hitting, I realize they devote a lot of time to their particular craft and nothing happens as we know until the pitcher throws the ball. But many of these fellows are better athletes than they now give themselves credit for. And if they were to uh, spend the time, if not find the time, to work on their hitting, I I think they uh, they show us a thing or two. There have been pitchers, as we know, over the years, uh, who have even served as pinch hitters. And Drysdale was was a, a good hitter, uh, and but I think now it's become almost uh, like an understanding that well, it's the pitcher. He's not going to hit anything, and they, so to speak, rise to that occasion. But I think again, uh, to me, baseball is a game even though I spent years in the American League, uh, off what Dave had told me many, many years ago, I, I just always believe that the best games are the one where everybody has to play, and that would include pitchers. Thank you. Um, all right, we have uh, a question about um, how did the AFL process help in developing relationships with GMs and pro scouts throughout the league? Uh, the Arizona Fall League, uh, we, had, uh, we had a good working relationship. Uh, the scouts, I think, uh, uh, flocked to Florida for the Arizona Fall League because they could see, uh, again, hopefully they were seeing the, the succeeding years, rookies of the year performing and, and evaluating the, the players in their own organization. Uh, now, uh, and it's a bit admittedly of a sore point with me, now so many veteran scouts have been let go in favor of, uh, of, of young people who are technologically inclined uh, that uh, I think that, that may have changed. But uh, the Arizona Fall League was uh, a self-contained 
uh, seven parks all within at maximum 45 minutes, one of the other. Uh, and, and it was a, a great thing for, uh, for scouts, for the players, uh, and for the general managers. Many, many general managers certainly in the fall found reason to come to Florida, excuse me, come to Arizona and, uh, uh, and perhaps play golf in the morning and go to the ball games in the afternoon. So it was, uh, I think, uh, a pleasure for all involved and uh, all concerned. Uh, whether or not that continues to be the case, as Major League Baseball tends now to use the fall league as uh, a bit of a laboratory for some of its, uh, excuse me, some of its progressive ideas, <coughs> Arizona allergies. <coughs> but uh, we'll see where it goes when things kick back into gear. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. What do you think about the, uh, the shift? And do you think there ought to be a rule against it, or do you, do you like it? And also, what do you think of the review process the way it exists now? He's asked about the shift and then the review process. Oh, the shift. Uh, I am amazed that more players don't take advantage of the shift by bunting against it or learning how to handle the bat and, and take the ball the other way. Uh, part of that, uh, I think we realize, goes to pitching patterns that uh, if they shift on a left-handed hitter to the right field side and he is pitched inside, you know, that becomes a, a little bit more difficult assignment. But uh, a lot of times, uh, given the shift, uh, you see people pitching not to the player's strength inside, but rather pitching him away. And again, I am amazed that players don't take better advantage of that. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think you need to outlaw it. I think it just needs to, uh, I guess I would say, die a death of its own volition uh, by people learning how to, how to perform uh, against it. Uh, replay review, uh, <laughs> When I was working for Major League Baseball, we instituted what we referred to as boundary replay, uh, because as we know, with modern ballparks, you have situations where fans are now able to reach over the fence. You've got lines on the wall. You've got angles, corners, and so forth, uh, as opposed to a lot of the older ballparks when, uh, when a home run was hit, it went over the fence, and, and away you go. But, uh, but now... <laughs> Excuse me, with walls and, uh, and angles and lines, um, boundary replay became a bit of a, a necessity. Uh, instant replay otherwise uh, was intended to correct obviously incorrect calls. Uh, and I think as a matter of opinion, what it has become is a microscoping uh, exercise uh, where did the lace on somebody's glove make contact with a sliding runner as he went by? Uh, the other, uh, aside from bringing a halt to the action in the game, the other uh, agitation that I have with instant replay is, as a matter of philosophy, you're really just having another human being make the decision on a replay review it's just that that individual might be a thousand miles away sitting in a dark room in New York. Uh, and again, when you look at the overall accuracy of major league umpires, again, admittedly, they miss calls just like players make mistakes. Uh, however, uh, I remember an exercise that was done uh, when we had umpire supervisors who would, former umpires who would sit in the press box at roughly half of the major league games played, and they had access to television monitors, uh, which would, as we know, show replays and so forth. Well, at the end of the year, uh, we would total up the calls and, and the missed calls, uh, and the easy thing to do would have been to have said, well, the supervisor saw 50% of the games, here's how many calls were missed. So to get to, uh, a hundred percent. Let's just double the number of calls missed and see what the percentage is. Uh, we thought that was a little bit conservative. 
So we quadrupled the number of calls missed and the umpires still were in the range of accuracy north of 95 to 97% annually. So again, calls are missed. Uh, unfortunately, as I have read, the only thing they report nowadays are the number of reversals on instant replay. But I think that, uh, I think that overlooks the basics given the broad range of calls that umpires make uh, and the high degree of accuracy in the overall that they, they really do have. Uh, I must tell you that uh, instant replay, I think uh, it, it's an amazement to me, one of my other, other amazements that uh, instant replay as it is now, as we know, brings a halt to the game and the pace of the game. It takes time. Uh, as mentioned, you've got the decision being made by just another human being miles away. And I saw in a Diamondback game uh, last week, uh, a call at first base where the runner was called safe. There was a replay challenge. And on a split screen, they showed the umpires standing there on the left side with their headsets on. On the right side, they proceeded to show six different replays from different angles, each one showing the runner clearly safe. And they had the time to show those six replays before a word came back from New York that the runner was safe. So this might have been an anomaly, but again, <coughs> amazement to me that MLB <coughs> worries about pace of game, time of game, and doesn't understand why they are the way they are. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, my comment is, uh, does the replays take longer than it did for old Weaver to get dirt on the plate? And the umpire clean it. But I, I kind of like the replay. But my question is, what do you think of the 13 or 14 man expansion of the pitching step? Well, uh, again, I think that that is a product of the, uh, I believe, of the modern analytical age, which has led to a lot of specialization on, on pitching staffs. Uh, but, you know, I, I come from an era where uh, you had five starting pitchers and the aspiration every time you would go out was to pitch a complete game. Uh, certainly that has changed as a matter of, of philosophy. And I know people have their, uh, their reasons uh, modernistically for making changes, but I, you know, I, I reflect back frequently on the World Series last year and the scenario with, uh, I believe it was Blake Snell of the Tampa Club uh, when he was uh, taken out of the game uh, because I think it was, uh, I think the rationale was that it was going to be his third time through the lineup. Uh, and again, I go back many, many years and I wonder uh, what Don Drysdale or what Bob Gibson's or Larry Durker's reaction for that matter would have been had the manager come to take him out and say, you're doing okay, but it's your third time through the lineup. And we think uh, there, there might've been some uh, interesting action there on the mound. Uh, but I think it, given you know the number of pitchers now enables managers to make probably so many changes that uh, it, it still takes something away from the game. And I think we are all familiar with some managers who would go out to the mound and tell the pitcher, you got yourself into this, you get yourself out of it. No longer the way of the game, unfortunately. Sure. Uh, um, what do you think of the rule change in June about the city stuff? Still and how much in the year did, uh, did uh, pitchers doctor up the ball? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the question. He was asking about the uh, the new rule change about the sticky stuff for the pitchers, and, oh. and then what pitchers in the past used to do. It, it, to me personally, I have a theory about that. Uh, back in uh, I believe it was 2018. Well, first of all, let me go back prior to that. Uh, it is my understanding that when the current commissioner took office, uh, he said he had aspirations to do two things grow the game 
And I guess they did that by eliminating minor league clubs. Uh, and secondly, uh, to increase the offense within the game. And I believe it was in uh, sometime the summer of uh, 2018 when Major League Baseball uh, bought a large portion of Rawlings Sporting Goods, the, the longtime maker, as you know, of, of the Major League Baseballs. Uh, fast forward and Fast forward to 2019, when home runs were flying. In fact, in 2019, at the end of the season, there were 1,191 more home runs hit than there had been the year before. And I'm sure many of you remember Jason Verlander saying at the All-Star Game uh, that you know something was something was very peculiar about the baseball. There was a sudden splurge of home runs and pitchers were reporting that the seams on the baseball had been lowered and the surface of the baseball was slicker, thus reducing drag. Uh, and you had this preponderance of home runs. Uh, clubhouse attendants who for many, many years had been rubbing up the baseballs before the game uh, for the umpires uh, were saying that the surface is much slicker. They, the, the baseballs, quote, no longer hold the mud. Uh, Major League Baseball was denying that anything had been done with the baseball. Uh, the commissioner was saying that no, the, the pill was the same and, and maybe there were uh, uh, production differences from the people who had been making the baseball for the last however many years. Uh, but uh, I think given that, uh, my theory is that given that preponderance of home runs, what were the pitchers going to do? It became pretty well established and, and Major League Baseball even came out at the beginning of this year and said they were going to be, quote, fooling with the baseball again. So what do the pitchers do? Do they stand out there and continue to give up home runs at the pace they were in 2019? Or do they try to increase the spin they're able to get on the ball and start uh, excuse me, <coughs> loading up, if not overloading, using foreign substances. So I think if Major League Baseball historically had not been, quote, fooling with the baseball, uh, the foreign substance controversy probably would not have reached the level that it did. Mike, uh, at the end of this year, Players and the union have to get together with the owners for a new contract. What do you foresee might come out of that contract? And do uh, you have any ideas or suggestions? Or will they ratify something so the season will go ahead next year? Well, with the, with the money that's at stake, I'd like to be optimistic and say they'll, they'll come to some conclusion. But as far as, uh, you know, what more... Uh, and, and bearing in mind, I'm coming from the management side on this. And when I, I look at, I, I'm sure there are some things that on the player's side, the players would like to have. Uh, but when you're looking at an average major league salary uh, north of $5 million for six months work and uh, the minimum salary now north of half a million dollars a year and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, uh, sometimes uh, I'm, I'm hard pressed to figure out selfishly what more the players could ask for. There might be some uh, rule refinements with respect to free agency and, and, uh, and things like that. But, uh, but economically, I think players uh, seem to prosper pretty well uh, in this day and age. Uh, from a management standpoint, again, with the dollars that are in stake for them to continue to play, uh, I think the ownership side would just be interested in, in labor peace. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out. Uh, players now, as you probably know, they even have chefs in the clubhouses uh, trying to get the players to eat uh, you know, more healthy food and so forth. Although, uh, ironically, sometimes the best laid plans, uh, players of the home, sometimes I've been told that as an aside, and I digress a bit, but I find this interesting. Uh, you know, sometimes the chefs, Chef Louis and Chef so forth, uh, you know, they get into uh, uh, contests, and you know, you no longer have clubhouse food, the likes of uh, 
uh, you know, at tacos or hot dogs and, uh, you know, things of, of that nature. Rather, uh, they're inclined to serve, uh, as one of my friends told me, uh, scallions of myrrh and brethel of yak, very highly refined foods. They get into these competitions. Uh, and uh, one club official told me, he said, you know, when we're on the road, the home club goes home or they know the local restaurants, they can go there to eat. But it's interesting when we go on the road because uh, all the players ride the bus back to the hotel. And because of what the chef is serving in the visiting clubhouse, when we get back to the hotel, there are usually six or seven pizza delivery men waiting for them. So sometimes the best laid plans, but both sides have every reason to uh, to reach agreement, whatever that agreement may be. And I, I think uh, from a management side, again, I think there might be some uh, some rule changes to refine procedures and so forth. But uh, economically, uh, I'm hard pressed to see how people can do better than they are presently. Mike, uh, I, uh, I'm compelled to ask this question because you've been in the game so long and seen it from the inside. But with all the issues that baseball is facing uh, now, uh, among the commissioners that you have, uh, that have been in office since you've become involved in baseball, which one do you believe might be or which ones might be the best ones to resolve some of these issues that baseball currently has? Uh, that for me, Francis, is, is an easy, uh, easy answer. Uh, to me, that would be Peter Uberoff. Uh, I would say Peter Uberoff first because of his, his business sense. And I realized that, uh, that Peter, uh, during his time in office, uh, you know, people point to the collusion matter such as it was 30 some years ago. Uh, however, <clears throat> uh, I will speak out of school on this matter and tell you that's not a fair rap in, in Peter's regard because uh, I was privileged to be in a lot of the ownership meetings, let alone the general manager's meetings uh, around that time. And as much as, as I recall, as much as Peter Uberoth ever did was sort of, if you will, read the riot act to the owners. He would say, Mike Port, uh, you signed uh, Francis Kinlaw last year for $90 million and he hit 202. Are you pleased with that contract? And in front of the other owners, what could that owner say other than, wow, that wasn't too good a thing? Well, uh, do you want to continue to be less than judicious in doing this? He would sort of shame them into some element of discipline. Uh, I think from there, some of the owners sort of went off on their own and said, well, we shouldn't be signing each other's players. It developed, it took on a life of its own. But Peter Uberoth, when he took over and after staging the 1984 Olympics, as he did and making that uh, profitable, uh, baseball, as you might recall, was as, uh, as a business was in some financial distress. Many clubs were uh, experiencing financial problems, uh, broadcast contracts and other things he did uh, Peter brought them back to financial uh, sanity, but Peter left office early uh, because he did the job, in my opinion, as if he didn't need the job. And I think that sometimes that's the way jobs need to be done. Uh, but a, a brilliant guy, a brilliant business mind, given what he did with the Los Angeles Olympics and the way he brought baseball and many clubs within it back from the, the brink of uh, financial disaster. Uh, I think he understands the, the players' motivations. I, under, I think he understands certainly management's motivations. But if I had to pick one commissioner uh, with a broad base of knowledge to resolve the situation, and in my mind, it would have to be Peter. Can we get him back? <laughs> Got a question? Well, that, I, that I don't know. He's... Uh, uh, he's comfortably over in uh, Newport Beach, California, and, uh, and still operating a company called uh, the Contrarian Group, uh, which does uh, very, very well. He's, uh, uh, I think he still has interest in baseball, but uh, uh, again, I, I think he, uh, you know, he has to be the boss. And I think, admittedly, uh, for baseball to right a lot of the problems it presently experiences, the commissioner has to be the boss and 
can't be uh, you know, running uh, in terms of uh, running things in terms of the politics. Uh, the commissioner has to be an independent operator and able to have the owners uh, as well as the players for that matter, be subservient to his direction. Yeah. Uh, the question was, would you broth have moved the uh, all-star game out of Atlanta? No, no, <laughs> I, I think I'm, I think I'm firm in that, uh, in that opinion, because I think uh, in, in, I guess I would say going back my day, uh, we were taught that uh, uh, we were taught the adage, no politics, regardless of your political belief, affiliation, what have you, we were taught no politics on game day and every day is a game day. And I think we had the realization that baseball was something uh, special in American society. It was a cut above uh, you know, the everyday things we experience and that that's why people came to the ballpark to escape, uh, you know, the politics and, uh, uh, you know, the financial comings and goings of the, uh, the ballpark was a place where you could go or listening to games or watching the games. Uh, baseball was a cut above. And that is one of my personal uh, agitations now is what I see as the politicization of, of the game. Uh, politics, whatever party, whatever one believes, but I, I just don't believe it has any place uh, in baseball or any professional athletic endeavor for that matter. That's not, that's not what the show is all about. You want me to ask about expansion? Don't you want me to ask? That's what I want to do to ask, but I have another question. Okay, which one? But an amen to what you just said. <laughs> I, I go to baseball games to escape. 41 years, I don't have seats to take it. But uh, I wanted to ask, oh, it's been 116 years since they moved the down with all these 90 plus pitchers. Now, it used to be rare for you had one or two guys to staff through over 90. They've got five or six in the leisure room, throwing 98 to 100. What do you think about moving the mound back a little bit as a conservative? Uh, well, uh, again, I, I don't think, uh, uh, I think pitchers in this day and age uh, are doing themselves a bit of a disservice uh, because they forget that the game is replete over the years with pitchers like Mike Boddicker, Greg Maddox, Doug Jones, and, you know, for that matter, uh, fellows who were really artists at their craft, uh, and it was more a matter of uh, command and control than it was velocity. Uh, you know, many of those fellows in that 98 plus range are also, uh, if they have not already undergone surgical procedures, prime candidates uh, for that to, uh, to occur. Uh, moving the mound back, I read that uh, it will give the hitter uh, an additional one one hundredth of a second to react. Uh, and that was meant as a positive one one hundredth of a second. I mean, is that going to turn our a, a bevy of 240 hitters into 290 hitters? I personally, I don't I don't think so. Uh, as far as the pitchers, uh, it, uh, moving it back would uh, allegedly diminish their velocity by one and a half miles an hour. And so personally, I, I find it hard to really differentiate between a, uh, a 96 and a half mile an hour fastball and a 98 mile an hour fastball. Uh, but the question becomes, uh, and I, I spoke to uh, somebody coincidentally earlier today who had a, a long time background uh, in athletic training with the Yankees and the Giants. Uh, and, uh, and he said uh, his concern would be the, uh, the mental uh, impression on the pitchers. Uh, you know, I'm now a foot or a foot and a half further back. Do I have to throw harder? Do I have to put more effort into every pitch? Uh, and it, would this lead to an increase in, in arm injuries beyond what already occurred? The only time will tell, uh, but uh, all in all, I don't know 
you know, that it's, that it's a good idea. I think people just have to be more aware of how people pitched in the past and make better use of the abilities that they have rather than just trying to throw 98, 99, 102. Uh, we all recall that uh, uh, a role Chapman of the Yankees, uh, a fellow who was more often than not in the range of 100 plus, we've seen him lose ball games. Velocity is not everything. Uh, but again, you go to a Greg Maddox, a fellow who had worked and mastered his craft. And I remember uh, when I was with the, uh, the Angels and Mike Boddicker came up with the Orioles, uh, no less a hitter than Rod Carew, uh, one day facing Boddicker, walked out in front of the plate and hollered at Boddicker, will you just throw the damn ball? Because Boddicker <laughs> would throw, as you know, at less than hitting speed. That's a lost art. Uh, you're right. Now everything is, is velocity. And I think in the ultimate, uh, speaking medically, a lot of pitchers are the, the lesser for it, uh, if not having their career shortened. Uh, Mike, speaking about that extra one one hundredth of a second to react, uh, we have a question about um, the sign stealing consequences dealt to the home club, to the Astros. What do you think about that? I'm sorry, they, sign stealing? Yeah, they, yeah, the question is, uh, what are your thoughts about the sign stealing consequences dealt to the Astros? Uh, well, the thing that occurred to me, uh, whatever, whatever the situation, and you know, I, I looked at these things more uh, from a, uh, I guess you'd say a, uh, uh, well, from the, uh, I was disappointed that the very first thing, whoever might have been guilty, who might have been innocent, uh, I was disappointed that the very first thing that the commissioner did was grant the players immunity. Uh, again, to me, a circumstance where this commissioner did not even make the effort to try to really get to the bottom of things. And I realized there were allegedly other people involved, but I would tell you that I think the genesis of this whole thing really had its start uh, about 20 years ago, so to speak, because uh, perhaps Tal recalls, but my, my memory is that there used to be a, perhaps not a rule, whether it was a policy or an understanding or what have you, that video rooms could not be in the proximity of the dugout. They were for the most part up in the clubhouse. Uh, my first experience with a video room right behind the dugout was with the Red Sox when we played Cleveland uh, in a playoff series. I want to say it was about 1998 and Jimmy Williams was the manager. And after the first game, Jimmy astutely came to us and said, you know, I've noticed over there on the, on the Cleveland side uh, and we were playing in Cleveland. He said, you know, every time we throw a breaking ball just before the pitch, there's a whistle that comes from the dugout. And uh, on further examination, uh, we found that as you went down the dugout steps and uh, went down two steps in the dugout and made a hard right, you were in the video room. So it was no small task for a video operator to read the signs, tell a guy standing on the dugout and he would whistle. Uh, we reported it to the league office and that was shut down immediately. But now I understand that there are an ever increasing number of video rooms right behind the dugout because players like to go there between at bats and, and you know and look at their uh, previous at bats and uh, uh, some of them uh, plead that they are not able to hit without reviewing their last at bat. But when you have that situation and you have the preponderance of cameras around the ballpark, authorized or unauthorized, uh, personally, I think you're just asking for trouble. Uh, when all of this came about, and again, I didn't delve into it enough to know you know, whether it had an effect, because you have to realize, as I'm sure many of you do, the Astros in that certain, you know, you had some pretty good players. And I think they are due some credit for, for what they did. Uh, sometimes even knowing the pitch that is coming does not guarantee success. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, when the commissioner said, well, we'll have to make more rules regarding this technology. Uh, to me, that was a mistake. In my opinion, he should have just said, no more technology. Uh, those rooms are locked. 
once the game starts and it still leaves within the game the capability for let's call it gamesmanship where if there's a man on second base and he can break a catcher's code good for him part of the game uh but with what's going on now and they're trying to prevent sign stealing by designing uh, a uh, uh, a pad a keypad for a catcher to wear on his forearm which will send a signal to the pitcher who will receive it in his cap as far as what he's supposed to throw uh, it's amazing to me that it has not occurred to the people in New York. You think signs aren't stolen from managers and third base coaches? You know, as far as, you know, hit and run or steal or whatever. I mean, it's all part of the game. The other thing with this new technology they're allegedly designing, where the catcher will punch in the pitch he wants on a keypad, goes to the pitcher inside his hat. How do the middle infielders find out what the pitch is going to be so they know whether it's a pitch that's going to be inclined to be pulled or taken to the other field uh it just so i think that uh uh you know the technology invading what transpires on the field uh is a, a danger to the game and i would add those of you who, who know me and tal will find this surprising i i once read something from the uh, the late physicist Stephen Hawking, uh, way out of my province, uh, but I read where Stephen Hawking said, some of the greatest dangers to mankind will come from advances in science and technology. And I'm not too sure he wasn't talking about baseball as well, because the more you, <laughs> the more you delve, <coughs> pardon me, the more you delve, to me, the more you delve into technology, the more you're going to need other technology to combat people who figure out how to hack it or whatever. It goes to the old adage, whatever man can create, man can put asunder. And so uh, I think just to leave the game on the field, use all the technology you want to prepare. But once you take the field, once the game starts, let the game be on the field and the players handle things. Any more questions? Mike? Yes. One more. Mike, there was an article in Sunday's paper about how Carlos Correa would adjust himself after the pitch when he saw what the catchers to your point. So it's going to be a curveball on a way slow pitch. He would keep to one side of fastballs. He would move, but he'd wait the pitcher was in his windup before he would move. I don't think he could do that. But electronic impulses into the center passes. But my question was at, at the uh, next meeting, you think they will consider expansion? I think of San Antonio which was like half a million people maybe when Houston got a team that now has a million people more than Dallas, second biggest city in Texas. And I'm sure there's other cities across the nation. Then would that affect realignment? There, there has been, uh, I guess I would categorize it as passing discussion, as I've read about it recently about, about expansion. Uh, and I'm sure you've seen the names of, of other cities, San Antonio, certainly, uh, Nashville, uh, Las Vegas, unless Oakland moves there, uh, Portland, Oregon. But I think Portland has, with the, some of the problems they have there, I think they've pretty much taken themselves off the list of possibilities. Uh, a mystery to me, and this goes back a couple of years, uh, would be why, unless he was using it as leverage, why the commissioner would make any mention whatsoever uh, about a club in Mexico City. Uh, if, if, they think, if they think the ball flies now in Denver, uh, you know, what do you think you would have in, uh, in Mexico City, which I, I think is an altitude of what, uh, maybe twice as that uh, of, of Denver. Uh, but uh, I think expansion becomes a, an even more complicated question to me because of the reduction of, of the minor leagues, the elimination of minor league clubs and the pool of players that are available even now to big league clubs. And I understand uh, that uh, it was said at the outset of this minor league elimination effort last, last winter uh, that Major League Baseball has plans to reduce 
by another number of clubs uh, within five years. So expansion, though it may come, the question becomes, where are you gonna, where are you gonna get the players? Where are the players gonna come from? Each major league organization now, uh, if they have 25 man rosters, each major league organization now has a pool of but 100 players, where as you know, uh, when you were allowed to have as many clubs as you wanted, some clubs had a pool of 150 to perhaps closer to, to 200 players. And allowing that quantity does not necessarily breed quantity. Uh, I just remember uh, you know, reading about a fellow by the name of Branch Rickey, uh, who was of the opinion that the more people you could have playing baseball, probably the better your chances for return on good players. And for that matter, the greater the popularity of the game across the country, because every every small town would have a club. But to expand uh, within the foreseeable future, with each club only having now 100 players at its disposal, uh, I, I think that that develops a, another question aside from whatever cities they might go to. Good point. Mike, thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. And appreciate the opportunity with all of you. Well, hopefully we'll, we, we can invite you. We want to invite you back at some point in the future. Your insights are certain. They are really good. And uh, we have, uh, it looks like um, over 35 people who finally joined in. So uh, we have a pretty good crowd, thanks to you and, uh, and your comments. So thank, thank you. Been my um, pleasure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mike, I know you have something you want to propose to the group. Uh, oh. Hello? Yes, I have my guest, Nate Walker, here with the speakers. Uh, but Mike, we got a camera right here. Nobody can see. Yeah, yes. go up front. Don't be shy, Mike. Don't be shy, Mike. We got real good feedback at our last Skeeters game in June, so we I checked out, and uh, some people couldn't make it because of the Monday. So I'm proposing that if we get 20 people again, we go back for our August meeting on Friday the 13th, which does not conflict with an Astro home game, and do the Skeeters again. But it's we got to get a vote. Otherwise, Bob will get Mike to come back again next month. <laughs> and, and lower the level again, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, same price, right, Nate? Yep. I vote yes. And, <laughs> and they are. Got Nate to research it. So the second half, they are inserting some of the proposed rule changes that they didn't play with the first half. So why don't you Tell us about that, Nate. And come up here. It's one of the cameras. The <laughs> star that puts up. Yeah. Yeah. So the big one uh, is going to be the, the bigger basis. So it's going to be instead of 15 by 15, 18 by 18. Uh, it's built to use three base hits, uh, stolen bases, action plays. So they're just trying to make, I guess, more baseball happen. You lose certain kind of talks, but it's taking too long in between. During at bats with guys on base, even that there's just too many, you know, non-action pitches. So they're trying to incentivize runners to steal. Uh, hopefully, teams value base stealing and base hits more. So that's kind of what you'll see. It's not super noticeable unless I tell you it's there. I think it's it's just bigger bases. It's not a super easy to see, but I know across the minor leagues, they're doing everything from you know pickoff changes. Uh, we're doing the bigger bases, so you'll get to see some of that, and obviously the uh, substance. Checks are going on in the minor leagues as well, so that's kind of the big one. It's going to be the, the big bases to what they're trying to, you know, install for our second season. We should be able to see the, you know, two more steals per game of what it's, what it's <laughs> supposed to happen. So, but it was about automated strikes and walls. That's in, uh, I believe. Uh, I think Low A is using that this year. So ours, I know every. Division, including the partner leagues, has different rules. So I know AAA is the bases, AA is uh, limiting shifting and having four guys in the dirt at a time. Uh, high A is going to be modified pickoffs. So it's, yeah, modified pickoffs, so you have to disengage the rubber before you can throw over to a base. 
And then low A is going to be the automatic strike zone, as well as really, really just two step offs and pickoffs per play. So across the minor leagues, they're just trying to increase seals, and that's about it, I think. So well, the Brett, still, big, uh, big brain needs this too. Will Bregman still be playing? At that point, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm with a big club now. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can promise nothing, but will the ball be put into play more often? Oh, I hope so. That's the that is more of an organizational philosophy thing, but hopefully there's more base hits based on the bigger bases. If, if the rate of strikeout is high in the minor leagues, it's the to me. I honestly don't know. Uh, I would personally say no. I think walks are higher because typically the pitching is not as refined. So from what I know, we've had some very long well teams this year just working on that. have been a lot of walks. So uh, I don't think strikeouts are high. I mean, our team batting average is close to 310, I want to say. So we guys, I, mean, I know Myers and Siri and Gaylin Cruz are all 300 plus guys. So and we just had a Pedro Leon, who's the Astros number two prospect. So he's in sure those training. Yeah. So it's a pretty good baseball. It's pretty, pretty fun baseball. So fun. It's great. Good for Ted I have the schedule here. All right. It is not the Baltimore Bluegrass. Uh, I'm going to say El Paso. Chihuahua. It's the Ranger team. Oh, no, it's the Express. Yeah. Bring back the light to oh, yeah. And the there's fireworks. That was my favorite mascot last year. Yeah, it was great. So I just asked for a game and you got it now. It's a rally slot. The slow is the funniest part. <laughs> Who is that? That is oh, it's Albuquerque. So it's the Rockies. So, oh, all right. Tell them, get Can people raise their hands if they're interested in going to the Sears game on August 13th? We need 20 people, including one of us. All right. I, 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 I don't see anybody on. Oh, I do. There, it shows on Zoom. Okay. Well, Marcia, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and three. How about wives? Eleven. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Eleven. Oh, oh, oh. Wives? Yeah. I, I, I mean, mean I'm pretty 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 I guess we're going to make brain kid too now. So, Mike, Mark, did you make it? <laughs> I don't think so. I asked, uh, I already spoke with Mike McCroskey about this, You and I asked for four tickets. Yeah. What was that? That was uh, Mark. Thank you. Take care of that, Wayne. Oh, okay. Good. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, now we're going to shift off to. Something we, we, we normally do, with, and that's a trivia contest. We always have a trivia contest. And uh, Mike uh, is also in charge of that tonight. And we're going to have to read the questions so the folks on Zoom can uh, have opportunity to uh, participate. Tal says he never does well. I think he's going to be the winner this time. I do, too. Well, I'm I'm gonna, gonna, well, he wants to put <laughs> Well, it's... I'll be chair. Okay. Thank you. I don't know. Let's read the page. You can. Yeah. Sure. Hey, can we share the screen? Right. We do this in teams, so anybody can yeah. share. Can we share the screen somewhere? I bet not. We got the screen oh, or in team. Hold steady, friend. I mean, yeah. There's... Yeah, <laughs> What was somebody's? Oh, he's trying to learn. Did you notice I was the first to read? Hey, Mike, we should have read the questions in the group. Mike, you got to read the questions in the group. 
Troy, I have the first question. You're going to read a question to everybody? I have a copy of the most well here. Here. You want me to read it? Didn't read them. All right. Question number one. Can everybody hear me? Hello, everybody in the restaurant next door. Hey, well, hey. Let's got the Bob's not here. In 1954, Wow. What big first baseman missed winning the NL Triple Town Triple Crown by only 19 percentage points? One point for naming him and a point for spelling his name right. <laughs> These are Mike's questions. Everybody get that first question? Yeah. Do I need to repeat the question? Y'all ready for question two? Yeah. Uh, Number one lost the batting title to the MVP for the year. Name the 1954 MVP. National League. National League. Okay. Yeah. Well, it just says MVP, but all right. NL MVP. <laughs> it just says MVP. <laughs> no, I mean, no. It's all right. It's all right. Yeah, I shouldn't. No worries. <laughs> Y'all ready for question three? Yes. Who was the first major league major league player to come to bat against Hall of Famer Walter Johnson? He played outfield for Detroit in the late 1900s with Hall of Famers Ty Cobb and Wahoo Sam Crawford. Despite playing in three consecutive World Series, he was better known for his locker. Name him. Interesting. Number four. Who was the first pitcher to win 20 games for the Astros? Number five. The Astros won their first pennant of any kind in 1980. Who was their GM? Is he a thumb crab? What? <laughs> what? Well, somebody said, is he in the room? What <laughs> <laughs> move? In one move. <laughs> Number six. In 1994, the Astros made the biggest trade involving an MLB player since 1957. <clears throat> For one point each, name the team they traded with, each of the two GMs involved, and each of the 11 major league players who changed teams. I think they need a few minutes to answer that one. It's all the people. Like quantum mechanics. That is quantum mechanics. <laughs> That's a lot of us. Uh, yeah. That's that's 14 answers. You know, Tom Watson's had an answer for He's got an answer to the question. So, yeah. I'll tell you. Boy, it's dope. Oh. Mark Albert. Are y'all ready for number seven? No. Well, yeah, John. Very good. Very good. I was with some 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 I was
Number seven. In the winter of 1996, the Astros made another big trade involving nine major leaguers. Again, named the team they traded with, the two GMs involved, in each of the nine MLB players who changed teams. Twelve answers. Oh, shit. That's a lot of points. <laughs> These questions. I agree with you. All right, we got a couple more minutes. Okay. Hey, Mike. Yes. I have a question. What is it? Using two knives, two words. The break? No. What? Ready for number eight. Okay, here we go. There is one team that the Astros have not traded with since 1981. In fact, they have only made two trades of MLB players with this team in their entire history. In 1976, they traded Mike Barlow and Terry Humphrey for catcher Ed Herman. Ed Herman and uh, Herman caught a no hitter that year for what Astro pitcher? For five points, name the team that traded him, and for two points, name the two players involved in the trade. In the eighty-one trade. The eighty-one trade, yeah. Okay. Number nine. Who is the first African American pitcher to be honored with a plaque at Cooperstown? Big player. Who is the first African American player to be honored with a plaque at Cooperstown? Ah. Oh. So not pitcher, player. Player. All right. Brian Barnes. Sorry. Number 10. What MLB city and field had the last inclined warning track in MLB? The last inclined 
warning track. Interesting. One point to be city and one point each. Well, for the city, one would have been one. Mike, you want to read these answers? Well, what? You want to read these answers? Yes. Huh? I'll even explain the question. <laughs> Does anybody need a question repeated? Okay, Saber has this little horse-eyed trivia that goes out every week, every day, sometimes two or three times a day. We go, Mikey. Yes. Mikey said, I actually got, they're hard to get. They used to be easier. If you're the first correct responder, you get uh, your name mentioned. So Friday, the question was, in 54, what? Big first baseman missed the triple crown by 19 points, and I got that. And it was Ted Klazuski. And once I got it, I realized I couldn't spell Klazuski. <laughs> so, did anybody get it correctly? Yes. Yes. How do you spell Klazuski? That's right. Yeah. Has it just Zeus G L U S G E W. Exactly. Ten letters. Not K L U Z like the radio C. Yes. No. You lose a point. K. That's the way I was spelling. Yeah. And who did he lose the batting title? It was MVP that year. What it made? Yes. Now, the first major league player, this came up on a text I was having. This is Larry Durker's question this week. The first major league player ever to bat against Walter Johnson. He played outfield for Detroit, 1900s, with two Hall of Famers, Zach Cobb and Sam Crawford. Despite being a preconception World Series, he was better known for his lock. David Jones lock. That's the correct. David Jones. And speaking of Larry Durker, who was the first pitcher to win 20 games for the Astros? Durker. What did he go in? Hmm? He go on 20. Yeah, about 10. Uh, he was in the 80s. Durker did it in San Francisco. Uh, Astros won their first pennant of any kind in 1980. Who was their general manager? <laughs> That's wrong, Sal. <laughs> I knew the answer to these. I thought it was a trick question because it was too easy. In 1994, the Astros made the biggest trade involving Major League Baseball players since 57. At one point, named the team they traded with, each of the two GMs involved, and each of the players that changed teams. Anyone get this one? San Diego. Where are you? San Diego is correct. Two GMs. Bob Watson. No, it was you, Tal. <laughs> you weren't? Watson. Oh, my God. I missed it. <laughs> and who did they make it with? San Diego and Randy Stone. Your sons? Yeah. Okay. I was involved, but I would talk with not the GM, but my bad. I made the deal with Bob Watson. Well, you're probably the only one who got it right. <laughs> <laughs> and who were the players? San Diego, San Friendly, Caminetti, Sedano, and who are Sedano? And who are Sedano? Berta Pettigreen, uh, Brian Williams. The Astros got. Uh, here. yeah, which didn't pan out. Derek uh, Bell, Derek Bell, Ricky Gutierrez, Greg Shipley, Doug Rogel, and the and the wrong Pedro Martinez. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the winner of '96, the Astros made another big trade involving nine 
major leaguers. Again, name the team, the two GMs, and each of the nine major league players who changed teams. 12 points total. So who was the GM? For Jerry Hunsicker. Hunsicker was the GM. Again, he wasn't tell. So he's the only one who got that. <laughs> and who did he trade with? Detroit. And he was the GM. It was your son. Randy Smith. <laughs> <laughs> And who are the players that Detroit got? Oh boy, uh, I'm drawing on a blank on this. I think Hunter, okay. Lando Miller, okay. Brokell went back to Brokell. Yeah. Then we got in San Diego and Todd Jones. Oh, we got a good bit. And we got Osmus. Osmus. Oh, Lima. Jose Lima. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> C.J. Nikowski. They wrote a good newspaper art article. Trevor Miller and the uh, protege Daryl Ward. Oh, yeah. He had a 20 home run season. Okay. There's one team that the Astros have not made a trade with since 1981. So I knew Mike Port used to be a GM with the Yankees. So I looked up. I said, well, maybe they made a trade. And I'll put this on here. But they didn't make it. On, the last one I could earliest one I could find was 1981 and only two trades that they had made with the Angels. So the one in 76, they got Ed Herman and Ed Herman got a no-hitter that year for whom? Durker. Durker. Another point for you, Tal. Oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and the team that traded him was the Angels. And yeah, because that, that's why I started looking it up because I thought Port would have made a trade with the Astros. And the two players involved in the 81 trade, you know both of them, but we forget. Who was GM in 81? Well, Jerry, uh, was that something? Before. before. So, uh, Jerry. No, 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 no. 81 was Al Rose. Al Rose. I thought it was you. <laughs> Well, you're the only one got that one. <laughs> it was uh, Dickie Don for Kenny Forsh. Yeah, so good. Ken was good for us, but some no hitter. And then uh, Dickie Don, we all know him. Because the first African American ball player honored with a plaque in Cooperstown, Grover Jones. That's right. Better known as Deacon. Won the American Association Award, hit 450 in a playoff in 1950. They gave him a plaque at Cooperstone for his year. But, oh, wow. but it was 1950, only three years after Jackie Robinson. So that was a good one. And what Major League Baseball City and Field had the last Major League and Climb warning track in Towles Field is not causing Crosley Field, where? Simpsons. Did you get that one? No. Look, where were you before you gave the Astros? <laughs> uh, Cincinnati. <laughs> what were they playing in? <laughs> I was playing that were probably all of them. I, that's the only one I ever saw, because that's why I liked it so much when you yeah. put that hill up a minute, babe, watching the game of the week. I just thought it was cool. I never saw that at another major league park. No, really that's a minor league park. Yeah, a lot of minor league parks. A lot of minor league park. Park. Yeah. I think Michigan State. But I, I just, I just, Crosby Field's the only one I ever remember watching Disney Dean back then and all of But that was pretty good. So that, that was it, and that was kind of the reasoning. Glad Tal was here tonight because I got a couple of them wrong that he got. How many did you get, Tal? I don't know. <laughs> Trying to add it up now. Anybody get more than two? Oh, yeah. All right. 42. Anybody get 10? Yeah. I guess I get. <laughs> Are you happy? Ten. Ten. Oh, oh, how about 12? 
town. I'm not going to fit that anymore. <laughs> uh, I've, I've got more than more than twelve. I mean, some some places in the teeth. I got staff for more than one. Two. I mean, this has been recorded. Uh, Anyway, that was a lot of fun. So it was. It was Let's look at all. Thank you. Now you can't complain about never winning a split. <laughs> Tell them the rest of the story. What's the rest of the story? Oh, he gets to write it for the next. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'll help. September. 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 I guess we're going to the skiers. You know. I think we got enough. I think what I need to do is go back and take all the all the national. Trivia ones that you have won and make that. Yeah, we all. Guys, and that was Mike. Mike. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I knew you were going to go. Why? Uh, so this out. Uh, 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 okay, we're going to wrap this thing up. We're still out. We're still live, incidentally. Uh, this meeting has been recorded. It's one of our better ones, and uh, I know Larry Turner is in Pittsburgh tonight. Uh, which, but he wants to see this thing. He wanted to be here badly. <laughs> they had a conference. Yeah, Brownie was on here. Great. You don't feel comfortable about coming back. Then we have a problem with, with, with us getting together like this. No. Can you vote less? No. Good. Okay. I think I think uh, we're in the second chapter that's going live. We're live here. And these two guys are just miraculous as far as the Zoom is concerned. Really? Yeah. I just let you get the Zoom. That's the thing. <laughs> Chris is a tech guy. I just log in. <laughs> okay. Thank uh, you, guys. Thank you. Terrific meeting. Uh, welcome to our new member. Uh, you may not be able to leave tonight. <laughs> until you sign the dotted line. You too. Uh, pressure, pressure, pressure. Uh, we have 152 members. And we had at least 36 tonight, counting the Zoom. And uh, they kept coming on Zoom. In fact, we had a couple of gals come on. Uh, our nurses that came on. So. I'm going to get Tyler to talk to us again, going to the skier game and have the meeting like 6.30 again before the game and try to talk about something different than you talked about last time. More like the the minor league structure, the A ball and stuff, and how they come up the way you know the yeah. structure. Okay. Okay. Uh for those of you who have a drive home like we do, uh the Astros will start 10 minutes back. Wait, that's the out. Thank you all for coming. Uh who, who needs a, a name tag? Doesn't have a name tag. Right. Right. I, I know I know about you. Gotta be a member. I'm a member. I know right. you are. Do you have a name tag? We're going to get you one. We're going to get you one. Right. I'll, 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 I'll drop Chris a note. Chris is our official. Uh, if you're on the roster, you get a name tag. If you're local. Uh, some people are. Well, we have I'm a few. Sure there. Well, with Maxwell tonight. Do you have anything you want to ask about? Another guy in the one? Well, it's going to be used by Captain. Something you won't be able to see. Come over. Probably not. Hey, Tony, you might have to speak up. Yeah, stand up, Tony. Well, we're, so, I mean, they're, we're ready to go to press. Everybody share this town wide open. Uh, we're going to have some interesting articles. Uh, thanks to Scott. And we're still uh, special authors. And Mark. And our, all, all don't forget Mark. Uh, by the wall, I'm sure, he was on there today. Thank you, Joe. Tony, tell everybody what we got going with your couple. Well, there there has been some discomfort or expressed by people who think the some of the players from the outfield were getting raw deal by the national press. But mm -hmm. see why cheap shots are being played, particularly about uh, opportunity. And it seems we have said we know here he was not part of the um, scheme as such, and uh, still he's receiving the kind of criticism by the by the otherwise astute fans from Los Angeles and the Austin in New York, who are heaven on earth must be Yankee Stadium in the summertime. Um, but anyway, we, we some people, some uh, members of our group have expressed some 
concern about uh, how this has been portrayed nationally and uh, let, let the people say their say. Um, I just read again the commissioner's report from January. And I must say it looks a lot better now than I thought initially. So he was very careful about what he said. So I think you have to take that in consideration. So what Tony's talking about, we have a chapter newsletter that's published quarterly oh, that. called the Shooting Star Express, and we all contribute to different times writing articles. And he's speaking about the article in our upcoming publication, which comes out when? Uh, probably by the end of the week. We have three articles on the scale. Scott Tony. Scott yeah. writes it, Tony is. No, I lay it out. You lay it out, Dave. What's so? Tony, no, Tony is our editor, and Scott is our. But uh, we share publisher duties. Yeah, they do a great job. And hey, Joe's involved too. Yeah, big time. Joe, a lot so of we email a lot yeah. of people contribute. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people contribute. And the thought is that the uh, next newsletter may talk about the uh, foreign substance, the sticky substance on the ball. So everyone's welcome to make their comments one way or another. Yeah, we and we all we appreciate any kind of article that you might have and submit to. That's something to say, right? Let us know. Is our newsletter available to the public through our website? Yes. So once we go live, we'll yes. okay. And that's that's I that's concern. You see, want to be careful about what you say. Yeah. Because you, it will be become public. Yeah, we even named it Houston Baseball Shooting Star. Is that the name? I think so. Just so if anybody Googles Houston Baseball, our newsletter will pop up. Part of it, so it isn't available to the public. Not just yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, everybody in Saber is labeled because we send it to. Uh, yeah, it's distributed nationwide. It's not just in our chat. Yeah. Yeah, so anybody would. Yeah, yeah. That's why we appreciate read any it. ideas that all people have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any comments from our people? Google. Yeah. Google. Yeah. Google. Yeah. Google. Yeah. Google. this issue, we'll get to the next yeah. issue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One other quick announcement. If you haven't heard today, Sabre announced that the convention next year will be in Baltimore. When is that? No, no, no. In August. Right. August, August. Next year in Baltimore at the Hilton Hotel. I'm going in Iowa. Well, one of them. It's on, it's on the waterfront. I'm changing my wife to get I'll never bring my wife. Well, it'll be my. Be the my birthday, you know. That's odd. Yeah, yeah. We'll see how that goes. Yes. Saber coming a lot online, so I hope you read this week in Saber. That's a lot of good information on there, and of course, their library is fantastic. Anything you want to know about baseball, biography, or otherwise, so they can a very good job. Yeah. You know, we, we were talking a little about the Cleveland Indians and why they. Name initially was the Indian. A lot of us thought it was the Indian guy who played in uh, Cleveland, saw the lots of sock lenses in the late 1890s. But I think Sabres more or less spelled that. It was a uh, the name was picked by, by the Cleveland band to write the name of their tracking the way they made the engine themselves. Native Americans. Mm -hmm. That's all it's all that. They liked it. Still do. Yeah, but Braves haven't made the change yet. I'm proud of them. They're staying. <laughs> okay, everybody, turn in your name tags if you would. Right. And we'll see you.